It is one o'clock. Uh, I see a quorum. Uh, so I call the Veterans and Military Affairs Finance and Policy Committee to order. Our first order of business today will be a bill uh, from uh, Representative Feist. Uh, if you are ready to bring the bill forward with any testifiers. Mr. Chair? Yes. If I, if I would, please. Uh, it's always been customary in the, the veterans committees that I've served on that we do the Pledge of Allegiance before committee. Is that something you intend to do? or? Uh, I thought about that, but we just did it a few <laughs> two hours ago. So okay. if you would like to do it, we can continue from, from now on after that. All right. But, thank you very much. And there, are, there is no flag in this. Oh, there's one over there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Representative Feist. This is my first opportunity to present a bill in person. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I had the honor to carry the Veterans Restorative Justice Act legislation in 2021 when it passed into law with bipartisan <laughs> support. At that time, I quoted the wife of one of the veterans eligible for restorative sentencing under the new law. She said, I am not a victim. I am a proud wife of a man that honorably served his country for 22 years. I am happy to say that since 2021, this veteran recently graduated from the Ramsey Veterans Court. On graduation, he wrote an email to his attorney saying, you truly gave me my life back. I'm truly grateful that all of this happened because I got the help I needed and I'm happier than I have ever been. I got to meet and help a few vets along the way too. Since 2021, many, many other veterans statewide have responded to the incentives created by the Veterans Restorative Justice Act to receive desperately needed support and treatment for post-traumatic stress and addiction, domestic violence interventions, and professional mentorship. The bill I'm presenting today does not make any substantive change to the VRJA. Rather, it provides clarification on the order of proceedings, which some, but not all, courts have found confusing. Specifically, the language clarifies that if veterans can demonstrate a nexus between a service-related trauma or injury and the act that landed them in court, that they can choose a restorative sentencing path. They are not required to enter a plea before doing so. This is an important clarification because it eliminates the procedural confusion that creates additional burdens on courts due to the uncertainty created in the plea process. I hope that all of you can vote yes on this clarifying legislation that ensures that veterans receive the full measure of support that we intended when we originally passed the Veterans Restorative Justice Act. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Heisen. And just to make sure that we've got this in the proper order, uh, I'll move uh, House File 45. Uh, you have a testifier. Uh, if you so would uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Ryan Else, E-L-S-E. I am an attorney, uh, serve as legislative chair of Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and a policy attorney with the Veterans Defense Project. This bill is simply a correction. Uh, there was an oversight in the initial draft of the bill. Um, I served on the working group that drafted the bill. The intent was always to have the plea come after the judge determined eligibility. This is simply just to clarify that as some of the courts have run into problems with this. What ends up happening if it goes the other way and the plea is first is the veteran ends up with a bunch of uncertainty that delays them entering into the rehabilitative process this bill was meant to encourage. Um, it also leaves the attorneys and the judges with a lot of uncertainty that holds up plea negotiations and leaves sentencing as wide open as possible. Could, your sentence could go from no conviction all the way to prison. That's not good for anybody going into sentencing. Um, we have approached the Minnesota County Attorneys Association about this. They don't foresee any problems with the bill, but they are having their criminal law committee meeting on the 17th of January, so we won't have their final opinion on this until then. I'm happy to field any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to uh, testify regarding this bill in the audience? No, seeing none, uh, any of the members have questions? Yes, please proceed. 
So I just want to take a moment. And there's this isn't a question about about the bill or how it changes things. I just want to point out, as a service member myself, uh, studies have shown that soldiers and veterans are much more less likely to commit crimes. So whereas we're talking about restorative justice for for veterans, I just want the record to show that our veterans are in fact uh, excellent citizens. They on a on a very much higher rate do not commit crimes. You are less likely to commit a crime if you are a veteran. There's something about the military that instills a deep sense of citizenship, and thus uh, just want the record to state that you are less likely to commit a crime if you are a veteran. With that being said, we do have uh, situations where, where our veterans do need the assistance that a bill like this would provide. So thank you for that. Thank you, Representative Olson. Representative Weiss. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ellis. Um, could you tell me what the success rate of the veterans courts are? Do we have some data to show uh, how well they're received and the recidivism rate and, and those kinds of things? Yes, uh, I <laughs> wish I could provide that data. The courts are not tracking the by data. There's no, there's nothing within the Sentencing Guidelines Commission or anything else that is tracking sentences under this bill. As a criminal defense lawyer in a practice where we focus on veterans, I can anecdotally say this is saving veterans' lives. We have more than a dozen clients a year who are on the edge of suicide or very serious accelerated criminal justice involvement that we're able to rehabilitate. Um, the quote of Troy saying that he got his life back is not an uncommon thing for us to hear. Um, I quite often will talk to a spouse of a veteran who says they got their husband back with tears in their eyes and a lot of gratitude. So it, while we can't provide you numbers, I can assure you that this is doing the, the job that it was meant to do. Yes. Um, also anecdotally, um, I had the opportunity to sit in on a um, Ramsey County uh, Veterans Court. And I met ahead of time with the judge, the prosecutor, the probation officer, and they told me that this was their favorite part of their job, that they loved it, they loved seeing successes, and loved supporting veterans through the process. Um, so that was very inspiring to me. Yes, if I could just Thank follow, you. follow yes. up with yeah. Representative Place, would you be open to a friendly amendment to um, insert a tracking and reporting mechanism because, well, it, uh, let me finish, uh, because I know it, it delays things. But the however piece is, I think this is a good news story for all of us that are either veterans or in the community to know that there is a concerned citizenry, uh, as well as legislators, that want to see veterans thrive. Uh, and the opportunity to do that, we need to know the, the good news stories. Anecdotally is great, but for continued, I think, funding and experimentation with this, uh, I'd like to see some tracking. And uh, I appreciate your consideration of that. Thank you. Good. Representative Weiss. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I don't know if this bill is the right place for that, but I would love to work with you on a bill to do just that, um, not just around veterans necessarily, but around restorative practices in general, um, because I do agree that we need more data. It's something that I think about a lot with a lot of my um, criminal justice bills. Um, and I would love to work with you on legislation to do that. And if I make one final comment. Yes, um, uh, the late uh, Pete Orpit, uh, my county attorney, uh, very uh, proactive in getting a veterans court set up in Washington County, and it's continuing under uh, Kevin Magnuson to this point. And I look forward to working with law enforcement and uh, our, our local uh, units of government to make certain this is a successful program. So I appreciate your, your openness to discuss it. Thank you. Pete Orpet was on the working group that wrote this legislation. Are there any other questions? Good. I, I would just like to say I, I encourage all the members to attend a veterans court. Uh, I've been to the Anoka County Veterans Court on a couple of occasions, and it's uh, it's pretty amazing what's accomplished there and uh, how engaged the judges are. Uh, they they all seem to really like this. They prefer to to get people back on track rather than put them in jail. So uh, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you both. And um, uh, okay, I uh, renew my motion that House File 45 be re-referred -re to the 
House Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. Is that you're on your way? Good. Oh, you have to take a vote. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite on your way yet. Uh, all in favor of uh, passing uh, House File 45, please signify by saying aye. 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 Is there any opposed? Thank you. Now you're on your way, Representative Fites. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and before uh, we have the testifiers come, or the, uh, uh, yeah, our testifiers come down, from MDVA and, and the Department of Military Affairs. I'd like to go around the committee so they get a, a chance to see who's on the committee and who they'll be dealing with uh, as we move forward. If I can start with uh, Representative uh, Greenman, and if you'd let us know uh, the district you represent and your interest in this committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am Representative Emma Greenman. I represent uh, 63B, which is South Minneapolis, and the Minneapolis Veterans Home is in my district. This is my second term um, in the legislature and my second term on uh, um, veterans and military affairs, and so I am grateful to be here. The, the, um, the VA hospital was also in my district um, for the last few years, so really engaged and excited to work with you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Matt Norris. I represent uh, District 32B, which is the southern two-thirds of Blaine and Lexington. Uh, I have the privilege of getting to be in the neighboring district to the chair, but besides that, we also have got quite a few uh, veterans in our district, um, kind of probably disproportionately so, and so I'm looking forward to getting an opportunity to do some good work with all of you on this community, or on this committee to serve those vets in my community. Thank you. Please. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. I'm Mary Frances Clardy. I am from 53A, which is Invergrove Heights, Sunfish Lake, Lilydale, um, West St. Paul, and I'm missing one. <laughs> okay, um, let, let me do that again. Invergrove, West St. Paul, Lilydale, Sunfish Lake, and um, I'm forgetting one. <laughs> I'm being really bad. But anyway, um, my father and brothers were veterans, which was really engaging. Um, I chose this committee because I was really interested in helping people um, with physical and mental disabilities. So that's kind of um, what I ran on, and that's what I'm doing. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Nathan Coulter. I represent District 51B, uh, which is basically the eastern half of the city of Bloomington. Um, I'm excited to be on this committee. My grandfather uh, was a veteran. He served in what was then the Army Air Corps uh, during the Second World War. Um, and I, I think what interests me most about serving this committee, in addition, obviously, to spending my afternoons with Chair Newton, is um, just the, frankly, the ability just to make sure that government does the things that it's really supposed to do. And, and the way we the way we serve our veterans is is really I think one of those sort of core things that government just has to do well. So I'm I'm excited to get to work. Uh, I'm Dave Lislegard. I represent Seven B. That is the majority of the Iron Range, and uh, I wanted to be on this committee. Uh, like others, my father um, served in the military, and so did all my. Uh, uh, my grandparents and my uncles and uh, I look at uh, where the world is and the sacrifices that the men and women of um, of the military do for us the very freedoms that we have sitting around this room is because of what they do for us and I, I can't think of a better way to serve them is to be on this committee to make sure that we're meeting their needs so thank you mr. chair yeah, uh, Representative Steve Elkins. Um, I represent uh, House District uh, 50B, which is the western half of Bloomington. Uh, my dad was a uh, Navy flight engineer during the, the Korean War and uh, grew up uh, uh, actually went to military uh, uh, Air Force schools in, in Europe most of my childhood. And uh, so I'm looking forward to, to serving on this committee. And Representative Coulter and I will have a bill to uh, uh, build a um, Veterans Memorial in, in Bloomington, working on that one again. That'll come before this committee. Good. Robin? Oh. Hi, I'm Robin Schmidt. I am the committee legislative assistant. Uh, I am also a veteran uh, from Desert Storm. Good, thank you. Uh, I'm Representative Jerry Newton, represent District 35B, which is Coon Rapids and Andover. I'm a 23-year veteran of active service in the uh, Army. 
Vietnam veteran and I uh, served 18 years overseas. I am Adam Copel. I'm the committee administrator um, for this. Uh, it is my third biennium at the House. It is my first time being a CA, so I'm very excited to work with everybody on the committee. Um, good afternoon. I'm Helen Roberts. I'm the nonpartisan nonpartisan fiscal analyst for the committee, and I have covered this committee since the late 1990s, so I have some history with it. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Jeff Diebel, House Research, I'm nonpartisan research for this committee as well as public safety. In addition to my duties here, I'm a proud member of the U.S. Army Reserve JAG Corps. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. Uh, John Hultquist, I'm House Republican Research Staff. I have staffed the House Veterans Committee in a variety of capacities the past six years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt Bliss, I represent uh, House District 2B, which is uh, northern Minnesota between uh, Callier and Callaway, uh, not including Bemidji. Somehow they looped that one out of there. Uh, I myself served in the Navy. I have three brothers who all served in the military, uh, one in Vietnam. My father was a World War II veteran, and I had seven great uncles that served in World War I. Uh, only six came back. Um, and the uh, VFW in Sioux Falls, South Dakota is named after him. And uh, I am looking forward to working on veterans' behalfs. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bjorn Olson. I am spent the last 10 years in the Army Reserve. I'm a captain right now. Um, one, I, one of the things that I learned that's a little bit contrary to what the NCOs will tell you is the NCOs will tell you that their job is to take care of soldiers. I think that's every leader's job. And so one of the, my exciting reasons for being on this committee is exactly that, to continue to take care of soldiers. I do them in the reserves right now, and my job here as a legislator is to take care of soldiers. I'm Peggy Bennett. I represent District 23A. If you go straight south on 35, you'll run into Albert Lee, which is our largest city, and then I have a whole bunch of rural townships and cities in that area. So it's a real uh, blessing and privilege to be on this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to serve beside you. Um, I am not a veteran myself or anything. I'm actually a former teacher of many years. But veterans and military members are near and dear to my heart. I have a particularly close relationship with uh, many veterans in Albert Lee through the, our, our American Legion. And uh, just, I, I love that. So it's, it's an honor to serve our veterans and military members in this way. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members and staff. Shane Hudell, I represent 41B, which is Hastings, Cottage Grove, Denmark, and Ninninger Townships. I had the honor of serving in the Minnesota Army National Guard from 1988 to 2012. Um, before I retired out of the Guard, I had a crazy idea to start a military nonprofit. Uh, got lucky, it took off, grew into a national program, and uh, we've given away a little over $25 million now in benefits to military families across the United States. So i um, excited. This is by far my favorite committee as a new legislator and um, obviously passionate about taking care of the veteran community. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chair, uh, fellow members and staff, uh, I'm the uh, kind of the bookend uh, to uh, Representative Fudel. I'm in 41A, uh, just north of that. So it uh, goes all the way from Cottage Grove up to Lake Elmo and Grant. So. Uh, Western South uh, Washington County, um, a, a veteran, served active duty uh, as well as in the Minnesota National Guard, uh, enjoyed every moment of it, um, and uh, Representative Coulter kind of put his finger on it. I mean, we are doing something uh, for folks that are really deserving. They have shown uh, and exampled for the state and as well as for the nation and uh, uh, opportunity to serve that. This is my number one committee assignment. Uh, and I got it, and I'm looking forward to serving with you all and, and doing good. Thank you. Good night, and we've uh, missed one person here. If you would uh, give us your information. Good afternoon, Chair and members. John Beeler, House DFL Research for the Veterans Committee. Good, thank you. Thank you all. And I, I really have to say it's a pleasure to have so many veterans on the committee. It, it makes things a lot easier when we speak our own uh, language and things come up. Uh, and with that, I would like to ask Commissioner Herkey and I believe Mr. Johnson to come forward and uh, give us an overview on the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs.
Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, please give us our, your name for the record and uh, proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Newton and uh, committee members. It's great to see you and congratulations on your most recent uh, elections. And, uh, it's good to see a lot of <coughs> returning faces and some new faces here in uh, the group today. Um, for the record, I am Larry Gerke. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. I was first appointed to the position in January of 2019. And prior to that, I was the director of the Office of Enterprise Sustainability in the Department of Administration. And prior to that, I served for 30 years in the active Army and the Army National Guard. I retired uh, in July of 2016 after, after 30 years of service. <clears throat> I do believe that this committee and, and the responsibility of our agency is sacred. It's, uh, we owe these veterans a big debt of gratitude and uh, I think what we're doing here is just making sure we're taking care of our veterans. They went out and done a lot of really awesome things for their country and for their state. Many of them carry with them mental and physical issues of which are a result of the time that they served in uniform. So, um, you know, people ask me from time to time, why do we care so much for our veterans? I try to explain to them that it's a little different profession than most professions that most people go into. And as I said, that I, I see it as a sacred responsibility that we take care of our veterans in the state. With that, we'll go to our next slide give us an idea of where we are in the state of Minnesota. You can see here from the, the map that uh, the items in white are existing today. So we have five veterans homes, Fergus Falls, Hastings, Laverne, Minneapolis, and Silver Bay. We have three homes that are currently under construction. They are in Bemidji, Montevideo, and Preston. And I can say that they are on schedule. Uh, the Preston home is a little bit smaller. It's about 80% complete. And the Bemidji home and the Montevideo homes are at 66% complete. And again, we're focusing on opening those homes this summer. We also have uh, three cemeteries that we currently operate in Duluth, Little Falls, and Preston. Those uh, cemeteries are located geographically to serve the uh, the, both the Minnesota veterans, and in this case, we do serve veterans outside of the state at those state cemeteries. Uh, we have one future cemetery that's currently under construction. That's in Redwood, Red, actually Redwood County, just outside of Redwood Falls. That cemetery, I was just there the other day. It's about 70% complete. Um, they are looking towards the weather getting warmer and so forth so they can work on the turf and some of the areas of, uh, in the grounds and the amenities throughout the cemetery itself. Uh, we do have on-campus representatives at public and private colleges and universities across the state. If you were to count all the locations where we have at least a person from MDVA there for one day a week, there would be 55 locations where we would have an office or some location for outreach that we can be there for our veterans. So I think we do a, a great job doing that to include, I uh, would like to mention also, we, we service the 11 tribes with our tribal veteran service officers at, in those locations also. Our mission statement, and we serve the veterans, their dependents and survivors, and we connect them with the federal and state care and benefits that they've earned. Uh, that last word is probably the most important part. I still have a hard time with many veterans uh, accepting help or assistance from the state government or the federal government, even though they've earned these benefits. We believe uh, today somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the veterans are receiving some type of vet veteran benefit, whether it be from the state or federal, but that leaves about half the population that currently is not participating either because, one, they don't know about the, the, uh, the benefit, or two, that they rather not participate because they're covered by their own insurance or some other means or methods. 
Um, I would like to also point out in the mission statement that we do deal with uh, directly with dependents and survivors. And many of the programs of which you've allowed me to help them and assist them are a direct result of helping those dependents out. And I think that's great that, because uh, as we know, the family serves along with the veteran when they go. And a lot of the issues that they bring back with them need to be worked out throughout the uh, family. So I think it's important that we do connect with those survivors and those dependents of our veterans. A little bit on numbers. Currently, we're, we just dipped below 300,000 veterans. When I took over as the commissioner, we were at 325,000 just in 2019. So you can see that we're, we're uh, significantly reducing our numbers. I can tell you those are our World War II veterans are, are going very fast, the Korean War veterans, and now we're starting to see a large loss of our Vietnam veterans. And uh, many of them are going, I believe, because of uh, non-natural causes uh, due to their uh, time that they served in country, whether it be Agent Orange or other exposures to toxic chemicals or other things that happened during their time. Um, I talked to uh, Vietnam veterans. In fact, I was in St. Peter recently and got to talk to a whole room full of them and uh, to share their stories. Many of them have many, several health concerns of which um, many of them are service related. So um, I think we're going to see a, uh, a need going forward probably of more support to veterans' families as they take care of their veterans at home and try to keep their veterans at home as long as they can and then at some point transitioning to our long-term care facilities that we have throughout the state. Um, probably the, what we're seeing here in the gender is that the female numbers continue to go up. I think about 1% per year is what I've been seeing recently. So that's, a, that's something that we have to be aware of as an agency and also as a state. And then um, indicating that the largest group of veterans, of course, are the Vietnam era veterans uh, being about a third of, of the overall veterans in Minnesota. I'd like to bring your attention to, I think just two years ago, um, we went over half of our veterans being over the age of 65. Again, that focuses on the different needs for our veterans. A lot of our veterans are getting older and having more needs and health concerns as they go forward in their lives. Our, uh, the way we're structured, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, commissioner, I have two deputy commis commissioners, one uh, Brad Lindsay for programs and services, and I have a second one, Doug Hughes, for my health care, and then uh, Right now, Ben is dual-hatted. He's actually a director for um, legislative items. He's also my senior, uh, our chief of staff for the actual um, mm -hmm. agency itself. Uh, the largest number of people, of course, that I have that I employ is in the healthcare area. And overall, right now, there is about 1,450 uh, employees that are a part of the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. I'll look at three areas as it relates to the health care division. We'll look at the current homes, the new homes, and then I'd like to touch on suicide prevention. The five current homes, uh, of the five homes, uh, there are four of them that are long-term care, and one is a domiciliary, which is like boarding care, but I would say board and care plus because we, we provide services that you don't normally don't see in just a, a regular board and care situation. We have 300 beds available at Minneapolis and the campus that you see to the right there is the Minneapolis campus. Um, at some point, uh, Mr. Chair, if you would like to bring the committee out there, we'd love to take you through the Minneapolis campus. It's uh, went through a significant upgrade since 2007 when we were front page in most newspapers and uh, I can tell you that all 300 um, veterans locations, residence locations are single bed 
with uh, their own bathroom. And uh, veterans really like that from the standpoint that that's one, the VA standard, but it also it provides privacy. It also it was very helpful for us during the pandemic to be able to keep people separated and keep the transmission of the pandemic from, from one group to another. It's very helpful to have those individual uh, rooms. Also on Minneapolis, in an older uh, building, uh, Building 16, we have 50 domiciliary beds. So that's sort of an annex from the Hastings where the main domiciliary is located. And then at the adult uh, day center, uh, we can take up to 50 people today. Uh, we actually went up recently, I just got briefed, we got 42 enrolled today, uh, of which we see about 15 to 17 every every day. So these um, veterans do not come to us every single day, but usually as the family and the veterans see a need, a lot of times this is a respite for the principal caretaker, and it's very helpful for them to be able to go out and do errands and so forth, and the veteran has a great day. We can take care of that veteran, keep them uh, focused on activities, and they can converse with other veterans, which is always a an important thing as we go forward. Uh, Hastings has 145 domiciliary beds. Hastings is my greatest concern right now because it's my oldest facility. That facility was, the main building was constructed in 1902, and it's had, I think, 20-some uh, renovations uh, throughout the years. And we're at sort of at a point with Hastings where we need to look a different direction and be able to go forward with uh, a new facility in there, I think, uh, long term. Uh, Fergus Falls has 106 beds, Laverne is 85, and Silver Bay is 83. Uh, currently, I just bring this up because it will come up during your discussion with the budget. We're about uh, 20 to 25 percent down on our, on our census due to the fact of staffing. We lost a lot of staff correct health care staff during COVID, a lot of retirees, some people just decided health care wasn't their thing, and we're starting now to build back that uh, staffing that we lost, that we lost during COVID. Uh, we've instituted some very good recruiting and retention uh, strategies, I think, to be able to get those numbers back up again going forward. The new homes, I've been working on this since uh, just about day one. We've designed it and completed, and uh, construction is under construction. Uh, we're doing well in all three areas. We're looking at June, July, and August for the three locations. Um, the Preston uh, facility is a bit smaller with 54 skill beds, and Bemidji <coughs> and Montevideo have 72 each. We've recently uh, hired the administrators in these positions, these locations, and they are going to be uh, now hiring their staffs as we go forward, so everything is on schedule. We've, uh, we've uh, ordered all the fixtures, facilities, and equipment, which is the money that was provided by the legislature during the last session, so we're on track with all the equipment to actually open these three homes uh, this summer. Lastly, in healthcare is suicide prevention. Each year we lose about 100 veterans in the state of Minnesota to suicide. Um, I think the highest year was 116. That uh, was in 2016. And our best year so far, at least from the preliminary information, is 2021. It looks like the preliminary number here is 94. So there is a downward trend, but one suicide is one too many in this area. And my focus here has been uh, very focused to try to create community clusters where we can have people help us to identify those veterans that are most in need and most needing uh, our help and support. Uh, to that end, we, we've got a good uh, program of which someday maybe I can get a chance to brief you on the program itself. But I can tell you that it is a significant uh, part of our activities. It is new to MDVA. The legislature provided funding 
part of the program just two years ago, and we have two individuals that we have that are working on this daily. And we work directly with the Minnesota Department of Health, who is the lead in this area. And we are developing uh, veteran-centric uh, strategies to make sure that we, one, reduce and finally eliminate veteran suicide throughout Minnesota. In the area of programs and services, there's three areas, uh, veteran services, <coughs> the programs and memorial affairs, and lastly, education and employment. Under programs and services, we, we have a claims office. Um, we are at the Whipple Building. We have a presence there. We're back open and serving veterans at that location. We have at least uh, an administrative person, usually a couple of claims officers that are located in that location. So if you were to walk in off the street, you would be able to get service at that location. We also provide uh, services as power of attorney for those veterans that are having problems with their service-connected issues. So we'll actually uh, stand with you as, like an attorney would and be able to help you present your case to the, law, to the judge at the VA so that you can get a fair hearing for your situation. Um, so we do that day in and day out. I did mention that we have an outreach and tribal um, operations where we cover down on all 11 tribes in Minnesota. And um, our outreach folks <coughs> help and assist throughout Minnesota in many, many different ways to include filling in for county veteran service officers when they're, let's say, they're uh, gone for an extended period of time due to medical or something like that. We'll actually step in at different county locations and assist the counties through that. We have a women's veteran program. We have a Gold Star Family Program for our survivors of our veterans. And we are also responsible for training the county veteran service officers. So each county is required to have at least one. Many counties have more than one county veteran server. They may have an assistant or uh, several assistants to help and assist them. Uh, we certify that they get through their basic training, which is two, in two different phases, and we have up to four phases that if you want to go to advanced training, we can train a more senior <coughs> county veteran service officer and what they need to know going forward. This has been very successful. It's a, sort of like basic training for our county veteran service officers and to make sure that they understand what their responsibilities are, no matter what county they are in in Minnesota. <coughs> The next area is in program is in programs and services from uh, programs and memorial affairs. We have a benefits program, which is our soldiers assistance program, that covers down on things like disaster financial assistance, optical and dental. Um, we are undergoing our hundredth year. This program actually precedes the agency when it came into existence in 1943. This program is currently uh, 100 years old, and we're going through a current upgrade of this that we think will make it um, probably more relevant going forward. And I'm going to be briefed on that here shortly, but I think we're going to see um, where a lot of our organizations have filled in, where we used to cover down on things like dental and optical. I think there's other areas that we can help and assist our veterans in, and I'll be Glad to bring that information forward to you once we get the Wilder study uh, done here for us. Uh, homeless prevent Prevention and Assistance. Currently, I have 282 veterans on the, the register. We, we are responsible for the uh, definitive register of homeless veterans in Minnesota. That is not the lowest we've been at, but it is lower than it has been during COVID. Uh, we're seeing a significant movement of our long-term veterans that have been chronic, chronic homeless veterans. We're seeing them move off the registry due to the support of housing that was provided by the legislature. Thank you very much. It's really working out well, and we're moving a lot of those veterans. I have was at an open house recently, had a veteran come up to me and just gave me a bear hug. He was much bigger than I was, but he said, <laughs> he said someone, 
someone cares. And it was really emotional, and I think it were, it's really moving a lot of these veterans that we're having a hard time placing with landlords <laughs> into safe, secure housing, and it's doing what you intended. And uh, I probably will come back to you again for the rest of that funding that we talked about last time, but it's doing a great job, and I just want to, again, thank you for that. Um, our veteran cemeteries, we talked about those. Again, the, the newest cemetery will be opening in the summer, summer or late, or early fall of 2023 in Redwood County. We have the Minnesota Core Program where we can bring uh, community-based services directly to our veterans. We do that through Lutheran Social Services, and they do a great job helping our veterans and our veterans' families with things Mental health is probably the biggest area, but they also help with financial, uh, personnel counseling. Um, uh, if we have a loss of a veteran, it'll help and assist the family in those areas too. So there's a lot of area, the, a lot of areas that the core program will actually cover down on. And lastly, is in the area of veterans claims again, helping with compensation, vocational or educational benefits going forward. <laughs> Uh, last area is in the area of education and employment. I'm very <coughs> proud of this. We've um, our head higher education veterans program is uh, looked upon as one of the best. I think in the I believe in in the U.S. Uh, we are the state approving agency for the VA as it relates to higher education uh, veterans benefits going to veterans uh, at our private and our public institutions. We also offer a Minnesota GI Bill, which is a 10,000 lifetime benefit to every veteran. And there's many ways that they can use that. It's not only just higher education, but if you want to get a welding uh, license or if you need some uh, type of permit or you need something for your job, there's many different ways that that uh, $10,000 can be used to help assist you as you go forward. In uh, veterans employment, I'm responsible for veterans preference that deals mostly with local and state governments as it relates to making sure that they're fairly taken care of as it relates to their veterans preference. And I get the last word on uh, cases that come through my office in which I get a couple each month that come through my office. Uh, the Ministry of Law judges provide their perspective and then I find provide a final ruling. And lastly, and again, thank you for the post 9-11 veteran service bonus of which this committee helped and assisted to put that together. I you provided 24.8 million as of to date. I've been with six months or 181 days since I was provided the funding. Uh, we've been able to distribute $19.3 million. We're, we've had 21,000 applications, of which just about 18,000 have been approved. This has been wildfire as far as word of mouth, especially through the deployed uh, individuals, veterans. Uh, what we needed to get is a little more focused on those veterans that did not deploy but served on an active status during that time period. So we're we going to be focusing in on them as we, as we go forward. And our, some of our stakeholders and key allies, uh, we work with the CVSOs at the state level and individually. The Commander's Task Force, which is made up of the eight largest veteran service organizations, they actually provide me a lot of focus and, uh, and so forth as it relates to their priorities. And I, I listen to them and we discuss what are the needs of the veterans monthly at their, at their meetings. I work hand in hand with the Minnesota or the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, all uh, three components of that: the benefits, health care, and also the the uh, National Cemetery uh, Associate, Association. Uh, we work. One of our biggest nonprofits is the Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans, or MACV. A lot of, a lot of our focus, as it relates to our homeless veterans actually goes through MACB and they're great, uh, great partners for us. And then, of course, the, all Minnesota veterans, their families, and all Minnesotans. Uh, last slide here, focus areas. 
Uh, we want to get, make sure we get the surveys and we pass the surveys for the VA and the Minnesota Department of Health. This will allow us to get VA reimbursement, which is important to our operations going forward. We'll be making sure that that cemetery gets open and dedicated here this uh, summer or fall. Uh, we have, in the area of veterans homelessness, we've declared uh, all but two continuums of care, which are really the two counties left, which is Ramsey and Hennepin. Um, so 85 of 87 counties are at functional zero today. That's the good news. We continue to monitor them to make sure, which is our responsibility, make sure those numbers don't go back up. They are not. We are doing a good job in, in uh, getting upstream as it relates to veterans homelessness. Um, we do have some challenges still in the two continuums that are still here, and I will need some help in order to get to functional zero overall for the entire state. So I'll be, that'll be part of my request when I come forward. And then lastly, I'd like to establish veterans community health capability, sliding the veteran suicide and awareness and prevention uh, program underneath uh, uh, that program and then also uh, establishing uh, some help and support for direct care at home for our veterans. Uh, a lot of times they're referred to, referred to as the hidden heroes. Those are the people that are assisting and helping our veterans. It could be something, I, I was a hidden hero myself. It started out with me sorting my wife's pills. At the end of her life, I was doing just about everything, dressing, providing meds, wound care, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's a significant lift, I can tell you, as a person that's lived through it. And I do believe the scenario that as our veterans get older, that we need to focus in on. So I'd ask for your help in this area as, as we go forward. Sorry about that, just a little motion. And with that, I think, um, Mr. Chair, I'm open for questions that you may have as it relates to the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. And, and Mr. Johnson, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy that you're going to continue to be our liaison. And congratulations on your promotion to be uh, Chief of Staff. It's, it's really good. Uh, are there any questions? Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, these are real good presentations and very uh, uh, informative. Is there any way we can get electronic copies of these sent out to the committee members? Thank you. They're, they're publicly posted, I'm informed, okay. so that they're available. Thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Menors. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Uh, Forgive me if this is a, a basic question from a, a first termer, but for the, the existing and, and the new veterans homes that, that we're building, what's the breakdown of the obligation between the state and the, the federal VA in terms of covering both capital expenses and operating expenses for those homes? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, I can tell you on the construction side, it's 65 percent federal, 35 percent state. And we've done a good job of maximizing every federal dollar. I can tell you is was spent and has been spent on these projects already. So the dollars we have left are state dollars that I'm holding to make sure that we get through the completion of this. As it relates to operations, that's a little bit harder question to answer because each person's situation is a little bit different and it could, it's based on the reimbursement of the residents that are within the home itself. Some, some individuals are of their 70% are above service connected. They are 100% federal uh, funding coming into our operations. Whereas a lot of other places, it could be private funding, it could be a um, combination of state and federal funding for each individual, so I'll probably more on that as I present my budget, but uh, I'll make sure to remember the question so I can be a little more specific for next time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was very helpful just at a high level. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Commissioner, before my question, I just want to say thank you for your service to Minnesota veterans, and it's truly evident that you really care and what better person to have in charge than somebody like you who 
truly cares and understands our veterans. So thank you for that and for your presentation. Um, I have a question about the veterans bonuses. So we passed, what was it, $24.8 million. And do you, um, do you think, is this going to be a sufficient amount to cover all of the eligible veterans or are we going to run out of money? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative, I, I, it's my intent to run out of money. The intent for me is we have 49,000 veterans that potentially could be eligible for this bonus. I don't know every one of their situations, but I, my intent was to get to 85% of that 49,000 was my intent. Um, I still believe, as I said in my opening comments, that there's a large amount of people at the $600 level that have not submitted their request. We also know that there's a problem with those who have served in inherent resolve, which is one of the campaign medals that was not included in our original request, and we would um, like to make sure we include that in our, as a correction going forward so that we can pick up those individuals. Thank you, Mr. Good. Chair. You. Um, if I could add, ask one more, I'll just yes, add, comment, yeah. question type of thing. Thank you. So you would say that there, there are perhaps uh, a significant number of eligible veterans where they may not get their bonus because the money would run out. Is that correct? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, I, I believe that is true. I think we're many millions of dollars short. Okay. Um, the staff has run numbers <clears throat> based. Right now we're about at the historical level of um, service bonuses for Vietnam War, or World War One, World War II. I believe we can do better than we've done historically, and therefore I believe we're going to far exceed the, the funding that's uh, provided. It's my intent to um, re, once the corrections are made and so forth, through the legislative process, we're going to refocus this. The time frame, we're only uh, six months into it, and I have there was a two-year period provided for those applications. So I, I will need additional funding going forward to make sure that we cover all the veterans that potentially could apply for this bonus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you. Just one. Uh, yes. One quick comment again, and I uh, thank you for that, and I would be um, very open to working with you. I'd love to work with you on that. I think it's really important that all eligible veterans um, receive that bonus. That's important, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Representative Bennett. And, and on that point, uh, for those veterans who sort of slipped through the cracks, uh, it, was it in here to resolve uh, that group? Um, are, are you drafting the legislation for that, or is uh, the uh, Mr. Kerr doing that? Yes, Ben, ben has got the, that drafted, I think, and we'll be presenting that as part of Good. one of the corrections for the, for the service bonus. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, great presentation. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the holistic approach on it. Um, being a daughter of a veteran and a veteran that served in the 40s with a totally segregated um, population, um, I'm really interested in in the future seeing some um, of the data being a little more desegregated as far as like age and race or um, that kind of thing. Um, and then also I'm really curious, um, I, I guess I wasn't totally clear on the functional zero piece and the two counties. Could you elaborate on that just a little more for me? Thank you. Commissioner. Mr. Chair, a Representative, there is eight continuums of, continuums of care within Minnesota. Um, since 2019, we've had four additional continuous care declared functional zero by the um, by the VA, by HUD, and by the United States the Interagency Council on Homelessness. So it's a combination of all three of them looking at our data. So we've had um, in functional zero. Just so you know what that means, that means it's doesn't mean that a veteran won't become homeless, because they will. But when they become homeless, it'll be brief, less than 90 days, rare, 
and only one time. So we're not getting people coming back the rotating door. So the intent here would be to get to those last two counties, which are Ramsey and Hennepin, that we have not been able to meet the requirements because of the fact, mostly because we have a lot of chronic veterans that we could not house or find a place to house previously. And uh, as I was saying earlier, the, the, the no barrier uh, supportive housing, my, the acronym is V-SHOW, but uh, for that housing itself, it's done a great job in reducing those chronic veterans that have been on the registry the longest <coughs> and getting them off the registry, which is gonna lead us to functional zero over the long term. That and the landlord incentives that were provided by the legislature have also been very helpful. We find that if the landlord's willing to take a chance on our veterans, that um, we can provide an incentive for the first year for taking that chance, that there comes a long-term relationship where we're renewing the leases in the same location without any funding because everything's worked out. But you gotta get that landlord to take that step to be able to house that veteran. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Representative. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm learning so much here. I, it's very good information, but thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a question, how, how about the funding, back to these veterans bonuses, for veterans who moved into our state from other states, how does that work Commissioner, with the bonuses? Mr. Chair, um, the, yes, there was an amendment that I believe that was made as it related to the people that, uh, uh, originally, we said if you're a resident of the state of Minnesota, that we would provide a veterans benefit, vet, veterans service bonus to you if you're a current resident of the state of Minnesota and if you had one of the campaign medals or you could demonstrate through your DD-214 that you served during that time. The amendment, I think, provided that you must have started your uh, service from the state of Minnesota. And that would be another area that if the committee was willing to look at. I do believe that if you're a veteran in Minnesota, for most part, you're here because of your career and you're probably going to stay here and hopefully you'll stay here to retire. And uh, we should, we should uh, look at that as, a, as an area that potentially would create another pool of veterans that would be eligible out of that 49,000 that are currently uh, have served post 9-11. Thank you. And I might add that some, some of the other states that veterans are, are, may have been moving from have already provided bonuses as well. So that's something we have to look at. Yes, Representative White. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Herkey, thank you for an exquisite presentation. Um, this is a comment. I'm not certain there's an answer to it right now, but it's one of those things that uh, as we're in a committee that is Veterans Affairs and Military Affairs, it's about STRATCOM. And it's about how do you reach veterans that deserve these benefits without overdoing the vision, I think uh, my colleague here, uh, Representative Olson mentioned, about is a veteran. if, if in people's minds, they think of vet veterans as uh, having PTSD and missing limbs. And we see wounded warriors. We see all these things on our airwaves. And sometimes having the, uh, the veteran moniker may be um, one, of those, one of those things that kind of tarnishes the service because we're, we're doing it so well. And I don't know how to find that balance, but I think in reaching out to those that deserve it, uh, and then working with the military affairs folks, because I imagine that affects their recruiting, um, where parents see busted up people. Um, we, we've got to do a better job of saying this is a worthy service, we're taking care of our veterans, and it doesn't happen to everybody the same way. So that's, that's kind of a, uh, I don't know, a comment, but um, I know through uh, uh, Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, there's there's, other ways that we can we can reach those, uh, but any comments that you have on that, Mr. Commissioner? Commissioner, Eric. Mr. Chair, uh, I 
I can tell you that I've read a lot recently on recruiting as it relates to the way that society looks at its veterans and people have served. I think it's important that we support them for the reason of providing a good recording, recruiting base here in Minnesota. And I think that in general is shaking his head up and down that yes, this is important. So I, I think you need to look at that as a committee that you're going well beyond just taking care of the veterans today. You're actually encouraging new veterans to come forward and to join because they know that they're going to be taken care of. And I think that's important. I think it's something we should keep in the back of our minds as we go forward. Um, so I think this is, you know, strategically, we need to look at this as interconnected between Veterans Affairs and Military Affairs, um, not only for, for the National Guard, but of course for active duty recruiting throughout Minnesota also. Uh, people do look at, and with the opinions of elders, I know are also an important, those that have served if they come back and say, you know, I had a good experience, I was taken care of afterwards, there's definitely going to be a lot more younger people that want to step forward and serve their country. Good, thank you. You know, it's 2 o'clock now. I want to make sure that General Mankey has a chance uh, to make his I just want to say thank you for your balanced approach and for your leadership on veteran yes. care. Thank you. And, and I, I also want to thank you. Uh, it's a very fine presentation, and I look forward to working with you and Mr. Johnson as we go forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. And, uh, General Mankey, if you would like to come forward, and Mr. Kerr. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, General Mackey, if you do give your name for the uh, record and uh, proceed with your presentation, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is uh, Major General Sean Mackey, and I'm honored and humbled to be the Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard. Uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, meet with you today, Mr. Chair, and your committee, and, and thank you for everything that you do for our service members. Mr. Chair. Yes. Would you please speak a little closer? Sure. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and with me today, I have uh, my executive director of the Department of Military Affairs, Mr. Don Kerr. I think uh, you, many of you probably know Don better than me, but, uh, but uh, we certainly uh, work well together. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of give you an overview of the Minnesota National Guard and, and then answer any questions that you may have. Next slide, please. And next slide. So, uh, you know, on behalf of the nearly 13,000 soldiers and airmen of the Minnesota National Guard, <clears throat> roughly 2,200 airmen and about uh, 10, a little over 10,700 Army soldiers, Army National Guard soldiers in the Minnesota National Guard. Uh, and we are, uh, the majority of our force is uh, citizen soldiers, so part-time soldiers, uh, a little over 80 percent, and, and the rest of us are, are full-time soldiers and airmen of the Minnesota National Guard. And really our mission is to uh, be able to respond to our federal mission first, which is where the majority of our funding come from, comes from, and then uh, likewise in a Title 32 role, uh, serve, serve for the governor or a national emergency if needed. Okay, and again, here's our, here's our dual status mission. Um, and I would tell you that uh, right now we've got about 630 of our service members, uh, both Army National Guard and Air National Guard, uh, deployed in the federal mission around the world. So of the 13,000, you can see just a small amount right now today are deployed around the world uh, supporting the federal mission of our dual mission. Okay, now what, uh, what um, DOD briefing would be complete without an org chart. Uh, so this is the leadership of our organization. And, and really our, the function of our organization is charged by me from the governor is really to source our units or to man our units and then to properly equip our units and then to train our units so that our soldiers and airmen are trained, equipped, and prepared uh, when they go out the door to either do their federal mission or their state mission if needed. Um, and you can see under that we have our Army leadership um, and then uh, we have our joint leadership, which uh, oversees both Army and Air. 
And then we have our air leadership, as well as the executive director of the Department of Military Affairs, which, which kind of oversees our state emphasis on our programs and helps managing, manage across the state and the federal level. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and this, this chart just really depicts uh, where we're at from a full-time force to a traditional or part-time force. Uh, and, and, you know, roughly uh, about 350 state employees. And then, uh, you know, the rest, uh, Army full-time uh, employees and then air full-time employees and then the force and as I said about 82 percent of our soldiers and airmen are what we call traditional or uh, part-time soldiers so they're working in your communities or they're going to school or whatever and, and you know I'll, I'll just elaborate a little bit this past week and we had the opportunity to recognize one of our air guard airmen uh, Major Katie Lunning who was awarded the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross uh, the highest medal for uh, aerial heroism, um, and it, that was presented Saturday over at the 133rd. And this is a true guard story. Uh, so this airman came into the Air Guard as an enlisted member, and then came over to the Army, the good side of the Guard, and uh, served in the Army for a while, and then went back to the Air Guard and, and went to school and became a nurse. Uh, she worked as a in her civilian role in the Minneapolis VA as an ICU nurse. And then later with her husband, they moved to Iowa, where she works in the Iowa VA down there. Uh, went, became certified as a critical care nurse, uh, deployed on short notice to um, uh, Guitar uh, to fill an active duty hole that was there in a critical nurse team and was uh, involved with the evacuation of um, service members and Afghani uh, citizens uh, after the Abbey Gate suicide bomber in Kabul. Uh, and uh, just a great story, uh, a total totally humble airman, uh, which is even more award, you know, great that she got to receive the award. But, I mean, that's really what you get in the Guard. You get you get to do your federal mission, but and, and this same service member uh, was activated for COVID because of her medical expertise, giving shots and advising, as well as, uh, you know, she was on, on duty during the uh, murder of George Floyd and the civil unrest for, with Operation Safety Net. So just kind of how things work uh, as in the Guard. This is kind of where we're at. We're in many of your communities. I, I know I heard uh, the representative talk about uh, Albert Lee. So we've got facilities in Albert Lee, as you're probably well aware, and, and these are the other communities around. You know, a lot of our facilities are in the Twin Cities metropolitan area because, uh, frankly, a lot of our members are in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. But uh, we're scattered throughout the state. You know, recently with the uh, winter storm activation right before Christmas, we opened up armories in Wilmer, uh, Olivia, and Albert Lee. And, and put about 20 soldiers on duty to uh, go out and help uh, uh, pick up stranded motorists and bring them back to our armories where they're housed overnight. Fortunately, they were all able to get out of there uh, late on Christmas Eve and we were able to get our soldiers off of their state active duty. Okay, so mobilizations. Um, we have mobilized approximately 2,300 soldiers and airmen in 2021 and then uh, you know, state active duty uh, over the past few years uh, with the with the murder of George Floyd and the, the Operation Safety Net during the Chauvin trial and the COVID pandemic, we had a lot of service members on state active duty, uh, really uh, abnormally. I, I am happy to say that that has kind of leveled out here uh, within the last eight months, eight, ten months. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're seeing ourselves more in the traditional role for state active duty as far as we responded this past summer up to International Falls to help with some sandbagging uh, orchestration as far as filling sandbags and of course the Red River flooding that happens almost uh, on an annual basis uh, up in the city of Oslo and then uh, recently uh, for the winter storm response uh, of course with the winds and the, and the light soil that we're in a primarily southwest and, and western Minnesota. Okay, so this is, this is our vision. Citizen soldiers and airmen really capable of, of doing the dual mission, the federal mission and the state mission, and really uh, being the most trusted in institution in Minnesota. Uh, if we violate the public trust, it's uh, difficult, if not impossible, to get that back. And, and you know, I instill that every day in my soldiers and airmen that, hey, we want to be the most trusted force out there and uh, just do the right thing every day, even when nobody's looking. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our three priorities. Um, next slide, please. And, and they center on people, truly our most important resource. Uh, modernization, I believe that we in the Minnesota National Guard have to modernize as our active duty 
uh, both on the air and the Army so that we are interoperable and that we are, are relevant for the federal mission and then partnerships and we'll talk about partnerships a little bit more in the next couple of slides. So simply stated people are really our most important resource. Uh, we can't do anything if we don't have the soldiers and airmen in our, our formation to execute the mission uh, first and foremost. And, and really, I want, uh, we, you know, not that we haven't focused on recruiting and retention, but uh, we are really putting an emphasis on retention uh, and recruiting. And I'm happy to say that the, the first quarter of our fiscal year, FY23, which is uh, uh, October, November, and December, we are 22 ahead of the glide path that we established. So we're doing a little bit better recruiting this year, which is encouraging, and, and we're really focusing on retention to, to keep our numbers whole. Today we see it on the Army side about 107% strength. So for every 100 soldiers we have, we have about 107. And on the Air Guard side, we're uh, about 98.5%. So just a little bit under where we want to be. Uh, on the Army, we can afford to run a little bit higher. On the Air, we, uh, we want to be about that 101, 102% because that's a, that's a sweet spot for funding. But people are instrumental to allowing us to do what we need to do. And really, while it may so sound a little Pollyanna, I want people to feel good about what they're doing for the Minnesota National Guard and really have pride in the organizations that they're serving because I, I think that keeps them in the organization and wants them to continue to serve at least 20 years. And at the same time, if they, if they have a change of mission and they need to do something else or want to go do something else, uh, we want their experience to be positive and maybe they'll come back someday and continue to serve again, either in the military or, other, or some other public service role. Okay, modernization, as I said, uh, you know, I'm happy to say in the Minnesota National Guard, um, our, our helicopter assets on the Army side, our UH-60s and our black, and our uh, Chinook helicopters, Blackhawks and Chinooks, uh, we fly the same aircraft that they fly in the active duty. We have the most modern aircraft. In our Armor Brigade combat team, uh, this past summer, we just fielded uh, new um, howitzers, which are field artillery cannons, uh, which are uh, the same that the active Army uses. And we have a plan, we're on the, on the Army's plan to f uh, modernize our Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and our M1 Abrams. Why this is important, because that means that we're relevant if needed for the federal fight. And like any soldier or any person out there, they want good equipment, they want new equipment so they can train on it and be relevant for the mission if needed. And on the air side, uh, you know, we have the newest F-16 Block 50s up in the 148th Fighter Wing up in Duluth, Minnesota. And we're in a good spot on that. Uh, there are other older generation F-16s that uh, other Air Guard units are, are, are uh, working to modernize probably before that L unit comes up for modernization. But we're continuing to invest in that, that unit's modernization and other things. They just recently put in a new simulation complex up there. And then likewise on the 133rd here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, we have H3 models and we are aggressively working with our uh, uh, federal congressional delegation as well as the National Guard Bureau to try and get them fielded new C-130J models, which will make them relevant for years to come uh, for the Minnesota National Guard and, and for our nation. Okay. I'll talk a little bit on partnerships. First and foremost, we partner within the interagency. Uh, our training center up at Camp Ripley is used by the Minnesota State Patrol to run their academy, as well as the Minnesota D Department of Natural Resources to, to run their academy. And then uh, DOT uses it every year for uh, their snowplow rodeo, for lack of a better term, where they do some training with their snowplow drivers before they put them on the roads. Uh, and then we continue to uh, uh, partner with other agencies within the state, whether it be MACV, uh, as, as Commissioner Herkey mentioned, the Commander's Task Force, uh, to try to, to do good things for our service members because they're veterans and eventually they'll be probably working in some of those organizations. I want to highlight uh, two partnerships that are, uh, one is our, our officially recognized state partner program and we're fortunate to be uh, partnered with Croatia, a, a lovely, lovely country you know, in the Adriatic region. Um, and we've, last summer we cel celebrated, this would be our 26th year of this partnership. Uh, I will highlight uh, there's a relationship that the California National Guard, National Guard has a state partnership relationship with the country of Ukraine, which we all know has been in the news. And I will tell you at the DOD level, the relationship that the California National Guard has with Ukraine uh, really facilitated communication uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine and, and uh, helped help with setting the communication outlets and, and really getting communication in and out of Ukraine to figure out what's going on. And, you know, we all know how busy 
um, things are in Ukraine right now, but the California National Guard was uh, instrumental in some of the training that went on as far as uh, with, with their partner nation. We do much of that with Croatia, with Croatia today. They are fielding M model Blackhawks, and uh, we are helping them with the training of that as well as the uh, logistical expertise. And, and, that, and they are also going to field Bradley fighting vehicles, which are the same equipment that, that Minnesota has with the UH-60 Mike Blackhawk as well as the ABCT. So it's, it's a good fit, and we're really looking for interoperability in, uh, in Croatia as a NATO partner to hit some of their NATO milestones. Next slide, please. Okay, and, and then uh, our partnership with Norway. Uh, this winter, we will celebrate our 50th anniversary of the Reciprocal Troop Exchange. Uh, and it's a, it's a re relationship that we've done for 50 years now. Uh, so we send a contingent of Minnesota soldiers and airmen to Croatia or to Norway every year, and they send a contingent of Norwegian uh, to Camp Ripley, Minnesota every year. And this is the 50th year that we've done it, minus a couple years where we couldn't do it because of the pandemic. But uh, and, and along those lines, um, uh, you, you, UCOM, European Command, it was looking for an opportunity for a partnership in the high north. Uh, so the high north, they looked at Finland, Sweden, and Norway. Uh, and they knew that Minnesota has a relationship with Norway already. And we hope to sign a state part, a formal state partnership relationship with Norway, hopefully this winter. And what that does is that opens up a little bit more federal funding for interoperability and, a, and an opportunity for our soldiers and airmen to do things in Norway, exercise whatnot, which I think is a good thing for relevance and, and uh, stability within the European continent. Okay, I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the units in Minnesota, the, the major ones. We have, so we have two air wings, uh, and I mentioned this briefly earlier. We have the 148th Fighter Wing in Duluth, Minnesota. We have the 133rd uh, Tactical Airlift Wing uh, in Minneapolis-St. Paul. And then on the Army side, we have our Joint Force Headquarters, which uh, I am part of, as well as it's a joint staff, which kind of oversees all of the other MSCs. Uh, up at Camp Ripley, it's a 53,000-acre training facility. Uh, and then within the 34th Infantry Division, we have the division headquarters, which is based out of Arden Hills. Uh, we have the 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team out of Rosemont, Minnesota. And then we have the 34th Expeditionary Combat Aviation Brigade, which is really spread out throughout the state of Minnesota. Their he headquarters is in Ember Grove Heights. Uh, but they have flight facilities that they operate out of, out of Pullman Field, as well as St. Cloud. Um, and then we have the 347th Regional Support Group, that's a logistical headquarters, and right now they are currently deployed uh, supporting uh, Operation Inherent Resolve. So they're in Kuwait right now, but some of their elements are, are in Iraq and other locations. And then we have the 84th Troop Command, which kind of oversees a lot of the other support units that support these organizations, as well as our MP companies. And then we have the 175th Regional Training Institute, which is that Camp Ripley, which does a lot of our professional military education on the Army side uh, so that we can continue to train our soldiers so that they're ready for the next level of responsibility throughout their military career. Next slide, please. Camp Ripley, I, I don't know if any of the members on this committee have been to Camp Ripley, uh, but it's, uh, it's truly a, tr a gem, uh, 53,000 acres in central Minnesota. Uh, from a person who served on active duty and then came to the Minnesota National Guard, I will tell you it's well maintained. Some of the best ranges that I've <coughs> had the opportunity to train on and, uh, and really an asset for the state and the Minnesota National Guard. You know, we open that up to our interagency partners, the State Patrol, the Department of Transportation and others. And, and really, uh, there's other units that come train here at the federal level, which brings money to the state of Minnesota. The Navy, the U.S. Naval dive uh, Dive, dive, divers do their training up there under ice water, as well as the Coast Guard. And there's other elements from Canada and other partners that come here to train at Camp Ripley. Okay, and then uh, the Department of Military Affairs, it's the state agency that helps oversee all of this stuff and kind of liaison in the Title 32 role. Um, and uh, that, that consists of about 350 full-time people. Next slide, please. Uh, just, a, just an overview, I'm not going to get in all the numbers of state active duty history, but you can kind of see uh, we really spiked there during the COVID pandemic as well as the murder of George Floyd and the <laughs> Operation Safety Net during the Chauvin trial. And then you can kind of see it's kind of getting back on the rails here to what is typical. Uh, you know, just recently, I know 2023, a 2023 fiscal year for us, but uh, that was the, the soldiers that we had on, on response for the winter storm right before the Christmas time. 
Hey, the budget financial impact on the state of Minnesota. Uh, our major programs are in, enlistment incentives. So, uh, you know, last year, I know the legislator passed an enlistment bonus, a state enlistment bonus. Uh, you know, I looked at the numbers just last week. They didn't make the slides, and, and we're still formulating that because it's right at the end of fiscal year 22 or calendar year 22. But about 300, uh, a little over 300 of our soldiers and airmen took advantage of that bonus. And so, what that means is if you re enlist for six years in the Minnesota National Guard, uh, you know, the state pays them a $15,000 bonus. If you enlist for four years, it's a $10,000 bonus. $10,000 bonus, and that really helps us with our retention of our soldiers, and and that is available to uh, you know people with uh, a little bit more years of service than uh, what is on the federal bonus. So uh, you know that, that that is helping with our retention. So thank you for that, and and you know we can provide more information as that as we get a close out on that. Um, and then uh, the other big one is uh, you know college education. Uh, uh, for, from state tuition reimbursement and the federal GI tuition reimbursement, as well as the Starbase program, we have a Starbase uh, campus at the 133rd Airlift Wing over in uh, at the you know Minneapolis St. Paul campus, and then we also have a Starbase uh, program up at the 148th in Duluth, Minnesota, that trains mm -hmm. primarily uh, fourth grade uh, elementary classes come in for a week and they go through a, a STEM exercise, and really the intent of that is to get students interested in STEM and and uh, they stay pretty busy doing that it, it's a it's it's quite a unique program but it it, uh, it it helps spur STEM and we see some some members today that have said hey I remember uh, going through the star based program at the 133rd and it, it's kind of refreshing when they come up to you and talk to you about that okay next slide please and then uh, just um, this is uh, what, what we spent on uh, state tuition reimbursement for uh, 2021, uh, about 7.4 million, almost 7.5 million dollars for soldiers and airmen attending uh, school. Uh, federal tuition assistance, uh, we don't have that yet for 2021. Uh, there was a there was a problem with the system, and most of the tuition reimbursement was really came out of the state coffers that year. Okay, and then economic impact, uh, economic impact of the state uh, through our federal master cooperative agreement, and this is uh, federal money that comes to the state. Uh, for uh, the maintenance of our facilities and the maintenance of our equipment. Uh, there's about a $53 million state impact on that. And then our, our total budget is uh, about $533 million. And of that, uh, Mr. Kirk, correct me if I'm wrong, but about 676 comes into through the state. Uh, sir, 676 is the total impact, uh, about $53 million. So about 90% federal funding. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, I know I kind of rushed through it, but uh, I wanted to uh, get through that. And then, Mr. Chair, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, General. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Representative Olson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, sir. Can you, for the benefit of the committee, can you kind of explain the difference between myself, a captain in the reserves, versus some of my best friends who are captains in the National Guard, with, with mostly pertaining to state active duty assignments? Um, how much money do they make? And uh, what kind of retirement do they earn while on state active duty? Because those are, those are important things to me, especially seeing as what they had to go through uh, on state active duty for the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, Mr. Yes, Mr. General. Chair, Representative, thank you for the question. Um, so, so from a financial standpoint, the pay that goes in their pocket on state active duty, they're on the same, we use, mirror the same pay scale that you would use as a day of pay for, uh, you know, as a, as a, in the Army Reserve, uh, where the changes are are in the benefits. So they earn no retirement points for that. And, and the other thing is, if they're on state active duty and they uh, have an injury, uh, you know, where we doing where you do an, would do an LOD, so it would be covered by the VA and every, everything through the federal system. We really rely on state workers' compensation if someone gets injured on state active duty. Does, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. So just a real quick follow-up for the committee. Every day that I serve with the United States military, I earn what's called a retirement point, which then goes towards my pension 20 years from now. Uh, well, not 20 years from now because I'm reserve status, but if I serve for 20 years, every point that I get allocates towards my retirement pension. So what the general is saying is that every state active duty day that my friends have done, which over the last three years is a tune of 30 or 40 days worth of, of service, they receive nothing in the form of pension bonuses for 
for that. And that's a serious concern of mine, seeing as we're asking these soldiers to go and protect us. That's why they're here on state active duty. It's to protect us here in the state of Minnesota, and they get nothing for it. I, I, I may be wrong, and, and uh, Colonel Kerr, you can probably correct me on this, but I, but I believe that's a Title 32 issue, and it has uh, that we don't have much control over that. Mr. Chair, uh, first of all, for the record, I'm Don Kerr, the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs, and I, I think I can um, address Representative Olson's question. Please. That it is a concern. He's absolutely correct. Uh, there is no, not a currently a pension benefit associated with state active duty. And we have been a little bit reluctant to come to the legislature to try to rectify that because we got some initial indications from the Department of Defense that they were open to the concept of pursuing an arrangement with the states that would allow the states to contribute to the federal pension program on a day-for-day -day basis. So basically, if we put a service member from Minnesota on state active duty, the uh, the guys with the big tables at the sky, I'm a, I'm a simple infantryman, so I don't understand this stuff. <laughs> the actuarials would be able to tell us that Colonel Levine's on state active duty will cost you 28 cents a day for a pension contribution that will effectively give him a retirement point, and it'll all be rolled into his federal pension. And uh, actually, we're, we're working closely with Governor Walls and the Council of Governors to try to negotiate with the Department of Defense to get that more in line and moving toward, in a direction. So you are right, Mr. Chair. It's really a, well, there is a, we think there's going to be a federal law solution that is supported by the Department of Defense that would be much easier and better because I can't think of anything worse than having a pension program that was going to pay me for 60 days of service over a 20-year career. But adding those 60 days in on top of my other pension would be something that would make sense and it would level that playing field. So we do have something in the works on the federal side. I will tell you that if that does fail, and we probably think it's going to take another year, potentially two, but if we start seeing that that process is going to fail, I would expect that we would be coming back to the legislature with some sort of a proposal to establish a pension for that service. Uh, but we think our best bet right now is to try to, to piggyback on the federal side because it simplifies a lot of things. But it is a genuine concern that we have. Um, for the most part, our, our past concerns have, since generally state active service roles have been somewhat small, a few days in a career, hasn't been a big deal. But when you start putting people on state active duty for nine months at a time, suddenly it kind of starts becoming a big deal. And it is something we think we're going to need to address at some point. But right now we're, we're following that federal path, if that makes sense. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Thank you for the question, Representative Wilson, because I think that's a, that's a good point and, and something that we should all be working uh, towards. So. Are there any other questions? Yes, uh, Representative Lizica. It's uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. This isn't a question. It's a comment to the general, to the commissioner, to the, the chair, and all the, and the staff, and then the people who served. Um, it's an honor as I sit and listen to you guys, and I, I just, um, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't go lightly with the sacrifice that every, all of you made and you continue to make um, for all of us. So it's an honor for me to actually uh, serve on this committee. Um, more than I thought it would, but this first committee uh, opened my eyes. So thank you. Good. Thank you, and we're close to uh, the bewitching hour. So I want to thank you, uh, General Mankey and, and uh, Mr. Kerr, for your presentation. It was excellent. And I know we'll get a chance to, uh, to see you again when we uh, get the budget coming in. So uh, with that,